Hello. So I am urgent going to be here this week once again. So I am here to start things solo for you. My name is Rick Lovert. I am the program director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, a program of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, if you are a writer, producer, storyteller in any format, you have a question about science, you can contact us and we will connect you to some a field expert for free. Um, <clears throat> we've done over 3,400 consults since we opened our doors in 2008, uh, including so many of your favorite films in which grown adults uh, wear full body spandex and shoot lasers from their eyes. Uh, so if you are also a documentary filmmaker, graphic novel maker, video game maker, please definitely give us a call. Uh, and if you are a STEM professional and this is your first time learning about the Science and Entertainment Exchange, uh, we're always looking for new volunteers. So please don't hesitate uh, to contact us and we would love to hear from you. Uh, I wanna thank our sponsors, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, without whose support, we would not be able to do this programming. Also, we get major funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and so many individual donors like many of you. I wanna thank Courtney, Sachi, Jeff, Ameche, uh, for tech and uh, producing work. So thank you so much. We couldn't do these events without you. Uh, today, you are going to hear from one speaker and uh, then uh, a screenwriter will uh, come on screen and have a conversation with that screenwriter. If at any point during the event, you have a question for our speaker, please uh, send it, put it in the Q&A right down here. And I will be uh, sending questions to our moderator uh, if we don't get to your question, I'm very sorry. Uh, it was my fault, not our moderators. Um, so uh, my rabbit hole this week, the thing that got me uh, super interested in just going off into another topic while researching this topic, uh, one is uh, The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert, which is a fascinating book, great read. I recommend it to my mother. She read it in like three seconds and loved it. Uh, our, uh, the other thing that I would, I have to recommend is our moderator's book, Animal, Will Staples, this animals, this book is great. I read it in about two days, which is fast for me. Um, and then also I want to recommend Shane, our, uh, speakers, uh, biology of superheroes podcast. If you want to learn more, you can get it wherever you get podcasts. I'm putting, uh, Apple podcasts as the link down below here. Um, so today, uh, Will Staples, he's a terrific screenwriter. He wrote uh, Call of Duty, both the video games and also developed the, uh, for feature films and Without Remorse on Amazon, starring Michael B. Jordan, among other things. And uh, look, as you're about to learn, uh, he is scrupulously researched and uh, a little bit of Indiana Jones in his own right. Uh, he's also literally a magician. And if you ever have a chance to see him perform, uh, well, it's magical. Um, and on the science side of today's conversation, I'm thrilled to have Shane uh, on our virtual stage. Um, you know, uh, within the context of climate change, it's mostly bleak news. And this is something that feels a little bit positive um, and could potentially, his work could potentially have some great outcomes for humanity and also really uh, great outcomes for uh, the future health of our planet. So um, no pressure, Shane, uh, here you go. Please turn on your camera and your microphone. All right, going. The stage is yours. Awesome, thank you. You definitely, uh, you did set the bar pretty high just now. Um, appreciate that, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen really quick. Okay. Awesome. Um, so I'm really excited to be here uh, and have a conversation about a lot of the work that my lab does. Um, you know, generally speaking, my lab focuses on uh, trying to understand how we as a species, how humans uh, impact the natural world around us. Uh, so if you, you can think about it this way. So, you know, life on this planet is about three and a half billion years old, uh, and it's kind of done its thing for a really long time. Then all of a sudden in one branch, you know, these weird hairless apes pop up and we begin changing things at a pace that is almost completely unheard of, basically faster than, um, faster than anything in our planet's history, except for the five uh, major mass extinctions. And if you look now at the biggest killers, the most prevalent threats to, uh, to threatened or near threatened species on the planet, pretty much all of those threats have to do with us. 
right? So things like exploitation, agriculture, urbanization, invasive species, et cetera, et cetera. And we can then further break these down into more of the things that we do. Uh, so everything from hunting and fishing, you know, to more indirect effects like extreme temperatures, uh, climate warming, um, air pollution, et cetera. And all of these things have an impact on the living world uh, that shares space and time with us. And what my lab has been interested in is not just how these uh, species are being affected now in terms of their conservation, um, but also the lasting biological impacts of our human footprint. All right, so I'm an evolutionary biologist. Uh, and as an evolutionary biologist, I think a lot about uh, change across generations. So typically when people think about the process of evolution, they think about it as this sort of slow, gradual process. When Charles Darwin, my man Chuck D, you know, first described this process, he described it as this slow process. Uh, but one of the things that we found in the last a uh, few decades is that, you know, you can actually observe evolutionary change in real life. And you can also observe uh, one of the fundamental uh, principles that drives evolutionary change, natural selection. Uh, you can observe that in real time as well. Right? And these sort of quick changes across one or a couple of generations are typically what we call microevolutionary change. Uh, so that's what my lab focuses on. Uh, and this connection between evolution uh, and anthropogenic change, I think, is really interesting and really powerful. So on one hand, uh, evolution uh, as a field reveals the lasting biological impacts of anthropogenic change, right? So not just how species are being affected now, but how the changes that they're experiencing now may affect them generations uh, to come. And then on the flip side, anthropogenic change offers some really interesting and unique opportunities to understand the basic fundamental processes of evolution in a way that uh, is actually quite difficult to understand uh, in uh, more sort of normal uh, model systems. And that's because everything is happening so quickly and it is happening right in front of our eyes. So we can actually observe, for instance, the very beginning stages of adaptation. So in my group, we bring together evolution and anthropogenic change uh, at Princeton. And we study this in a lot of different ways and a lot of different systems, uh, everything from uh, looking at the effects of urbanization on the evolution of lizards across the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, we study the wolves in Chernobyl, uh, looking at the impacts of radiation on adaptation. Um, we study alligators and polluted waters in Florida, um, elephants uh, evolving tusklessness in response to, um, to poaching, like all of, a lot of different aspects of, uh, of human nature in a lot of different systems. And this all combines to give a really broad um, perspective on our lasting uh, human footprint. Uh, so I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about uh, my work, and I'm super excited to talk uh, with Will Staples about this work, you know, because I know that he's been thinking a lot about very similar subjects from a very different lens. Yeah, you know, and yeah, you know, as a scientist and as you know, a citizen, I truly believe that um, you know the major leaps forward that you know that are going to happen both in the sciences and in our sort of general understanding happen at the intersection of disciplines that have traditionally not talked to each other and i think this is a really cool interesting opportunity um to draw some of those crossroads uh so will are you around i am here you got me i think we're still on screen share shane there we go Awesome. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Shannon. I'm really excited to be talking to you about talking to you about this. I, uh, you know, obviously as we as we've discussed, I come at this from a slightly different angle. You know, most of my um, you know, history looking into wildlife has been investigating organized crime and some of the factors driving the end of wildlife as we know it. And you know, I think your work seems to have a bit of a different perspective. So I was curious first to ask you, you know, in your opinion. You know, does it seem like we're inexorably trundling towards the end of wildlife, or is it that we are really just looking at a next phase in a different world than the one that we live in now? Yes, yeah, so the end of of wildlife writ large is a is a pretty tall order. Um, I mean, life in general is pretty resilient. Um, you know, we can see that in the five major extinction events that have happened uh, in the past. You know, will 
humans will, you know, will the natural world survive humans? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, but I also think, um, you know, if things don't change very quickly, um, what survives, what comes out the other end is going to look fundamentally different uh, than what we have now. And that's what we've seen in the last five major extinction events. You know, pretty much before every single extinction event, there was a diversity of organisms that more or less dominated the planet. The, an extinction event happens, you know, that group of animals essentially gets wiped out. And then another group moves into those niches and diversifies, right? If we think about the KT boundary um, before the, you know, during the Cretaceous, you know, the world was dominated by massive lizards, you know, meteor hits, wipes everything out. And then these, you know, small, tiny mouse looking things, which basically all mammals were at that time, begin to diversify into all of the organisms that, you know, we see now, including us. So what comes out of the end of, you know, our impact on the planet, you know, I think life will survive, but it could look very, very different. And I think a big question is, you know, how different are we willing to let things look, you know, like, is it okay if, you know, your grandchildren and great grandchildren don't have tigers and pandas and elephants and, you know, all of this, you know, amazing uh, megafauna, these like large bodied organisms that we've all, you know, come to grow and, and, and love uh, during our lifetimes. You know, those are the species that are probably going to be impacted first. Um, and, uh, you know, there are other more resilient species, things like cockroaches that are, more, you know, that are more likely to survive. So, you know, maybe the next diversification of life is, you know, cockroaches moving into, you know, all the different niches that mammals and birds and reptiles are in right now. So Shane, you know, you mentioned that, you know, the KT boundary, it sort of marked the like beginning of the, the big great mammal party. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're looking at uh, the current era, what besides, you know, cockroaches and jellyfish and viruses, like who are some of the other winners in this new world dominated by man? Yeah, so the major winners are the things that we've brought along with us, right? Those things that we have favored uh, for one reason or another. Um, you know, so obviously uh, agricultural crops, right? Things like wheat, corn, uh, rice, you know, these are like these plants dominate, you know, a large part of the planet. Um, the things that, um, you know, other domestic species, so things like cats, dogs, chickens, pigs, etc. Um, like these are the dominant organisms on the planet. You know, just to give you some, um, you know, some clear understanding of what I mean when I say dominant, it's like if you look at the terrestrial world, right, and you were to measure, uh, you were to measure all of the living organisms uh, in the terrestrial biosphere by the amount of carbon, you know, that they're made up of, um, you know, humans and the things that we have domesticated um, would make up uh, about 97% of the total terrestrial biomass, right? And so that's just us and chickens and pigs and, you know, those things that we have uh, domesticated. And then that last 3%, like, that's what the rest of the terrestrial tree of life has to occupy right now, you know, and that has taken place, you know, modern humans somewhere between 300,000 and 100,000 years old, but really like, you know, the, the, the big sort of upswing and change happened, what, 150 years ago. So it's a pretty massive change in a very small period of time, especially um, when you look at it on an evolutionary scale. Right, so talking about evolutionary scale, small scale of time, I, I think one of the things that really blew my mind about your work is that I had never heard the term rapid evolution before, or even had a sense of, of what that is. And you know, I was wondering maybe you could talk a little bit about a little bit about that. And then also, uh, I'm sure every single entertainment person on this Zoom heard wolves at Chernobyl and was like, "What?" So maybe you could circle back on that one too. Okay. Yeah. So um, when I say rapid evolution, um, just to give you uh, a bit of an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, so part of my lab uh, studies the effects of urbanization uh, on, um, you know, on animals that share cities with us. Um, you know, urban environments like cities are, they're the fastest growing ecosystem on the planet. 
Um, cities are becoming more city-like. They're getting larger. The human populations are getting denser. We just passed the point where half the human population lives in cities, and that's only going to continue to grow. But cities for wildlife are very strange environments, very alien environments in the sense that, you know, the substrates are very different, the dangers are very different, even like the abiotic properties, right, temperature, humidity is very, very different uh, in cities than in the surrounding uh, natural areas. And we've been really interested in how species adapt uh, to these differences. So we've been studying this a small lizard um, called an anole, uh, the crested anole that occurs in Puerto Rico. Uh, and this anole is pretty abundant, probably one of the most abundant vertebrates on the island of Puerto Rico. And it's independently colonized uh, cities several different times across the island. Uh, so this acts, so we essentially use this system as um, sort of natural replicates, right? So we can look at how an animal has moved from the forest into a city and how it's adapted to that city life, not just once, but several times in each instance. Yeah, and um, my postdoc, Kristen Winchell, um, she started this work. And one of the very first things that she found is that these anoles, which are um, arboreal, they spend a lot of their time on vertical surfaces, they actually evolved longer limbs in cities um, because they're they're uh, using these very wide perches. They're using buildings instead of trees. Uh, they're using uh, things like painted uh, concrete and metal instead of uh, instead of bark. So they've evolved longer limbs to deal with these broader perches and larger toe pads. These sort of sticky. Uh, finger pads that allow them to stick to vertical surfaces, they're much larger in those cities. And even when you raise urban and forest animals in a common environment, they still have these differences, right? Which strongly suggests that there's um, a genetic basis to those changes. And we've been also looking at um, the evolution of thermal tolerance in these cities. So another big uh, aspect of urbanization is urban heat islands because there are so many different artificial surfaces. Cities become very, very warm environments, much warmer than the surrounding environments. And lizards are very thermally sensitive. They're ectotherms, or what typically call cold-blooded species. So their performance is very linked to ambient temperature. And we found that uh, the, these urban lizards also uh, have much higher thermal tolerance than their forest counterparts. Wow, and so, but you know, our picture of evolution, I feel like when we think of evolution, it's sort of like the, the standard image of like, you know, an ape hunched over, hunched over a little less, hunched over a little less, and eventually standing up, right? Or like a giraffe gets taller and taller. But when you're talking about the green anoles, like some of those changes are like single generation changes, right? Yes, right. So first of all, that that image that you're talking about is probably the worst thing. That's like the worst PR that's ever been done for evolutionary biology, um, because that is not how evolution works. You know, the sort of progression from like the chimp to the walking person, right, suggests that there's some kind of direct linear progression of those things, and that's just not how evolution works. Evolution is um, it's a branching pattern, right? So in the same way that like me and my sister, like we share a mother, right? There's two branches that come together at, you know, our mother. And then I can go to any given person on the planet, you know, and find those connections. And even me and my dog, you know, we can, I can find the connections that, you know, connect us together, right? And it's a sort of branching pattern, more so than this sort of linear uh, progression that you see in that, uh, in that image. Um, and then I ranted about that and forgot what the actual question was. With the green anoles, like, you, you know, in your research, it sounds like some of this stuff wasn't like generationally, they got like stickier and stickier until they were like spider manning on buildings. It sounded like for the cold snap, that was like one generation, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so there are two things that, that we can measure here. So, you know, evolution occurs by two different means, right? One is just sort of random change. Um, and uh, the second is evolution by natural selection, um, right? With, you know, tip, what people typically think about when they think about the process of evolution. But natural selection is a process that can happen instantaneously, right? So if you have variation in a given population in some aspect of performance, then you have an environment where some individuals are better fit to survive than others. As soon as you have that differential survivorship, that is natural selection. All right. 
But it's when those genes, if those differences are encoded by genes, when those specific alleles, those particular versions of those genes get passed on to the next generation, that's evolution. Right? And so that's evolutionary response uh, to natural selection. So in small lizards, right? So in you know the case of you know uh, like extreme weather events, you know you go before you see what was there before and then you know a hurricane comes and then you go back a week later and you see what's left and those differences that you measure right that could be natural selection right could happen just that quickly um but then for anoles for instance they have a generation time of about a year so you know around the same like within one calendar year you get the turnover of generations and if those alleles are passed on, then all of a sudden you have evolution, evolution, right? So that's, that's a uh, micro evolution. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the mechanics of evolution, but to set the table for that, maybe you could talk a little bit about the wolves at Chernobyl. Cause I think that's like, that's a really crazy case study. Um, and one, it's like, we're obviously like as, as Hollywood people, we think wolves at Chernobyl and it's like green eyes and, you know, three heads coming after you, but yeah. why are the, why, are they interesting beyond sounding really cool for a horror movie? Yeah, so this is the, the sort of other side of, um, you know, of this equation, this sort of link between anthropogenic change and, and evolution is that, you know, because animals are living alongside, of, uh, alongside us, they're being exposed to a lot of things that we're being exposed to. Uh, and the solutions that natural selection comes up with um, in those cases or in the natural world may actually lead us to specific solutions, um, you know, for our own purposes, things like medicine, All right? So in the case of Chernobyl, um, you know, Chernobyl erupted, uh, the Chernobyl, the Chernobyl event happened, um, I think it was a, a day before my first birthday, it was like 1986, April 26, 1986 or something like that. Um, and the radiation exposure there's something that has, you know, has never been experienced before in like such a short period of time. Uh, and the, so we're studying the wolves that uh, hunt within the Chernobyl exclusion zone, because now at this point, these animals have been exposed to ionizing radiation for about five or six generations. Right. And, um, you know, we know that ionizing radiation has um, has all sorts of negative consequences on uh, on the mammalian body, on you know living animals writ large, and amongst them are, uh, are um, you know they um, uh, promote cancer formation, uh, or what's called oncogenesis. Uh, so we've been studying uh, the we've been studying the wolves in Chernobyl to understand um, you know if there's the potential of having an adaptive response to ionizing radiation that would make the mammalian immune system um, better adapted uh, to um, uh, to fight off cancers essentially All right and wolves are actually a really interesting um, organism to study this in because you know one they are pretty long-lived animals right so they live about five or six years which means they live long enough to sort of bioaccumulate um, across their lifetime, right, as they continuously eat and as they're continuously exposed to radiation, it sort of accumulates in the body. Um, and then they're also apex predators, which means they eat at the top of the food chain, um, which means they get also what's called biomagnification, right? So, um, you know, radiation, um, you know, affects grass, which is which then is concentrated and affects the herbivores that eat it, which then is further concentrated. And then the wolves eat those herbivores. So they get this big dose of radiation uh, in every meal uh, from the food they're eating just because they eat at the top of the food chain. And those two things, right, that long life and eating at the top of the food chain um, are also things that are of, in, th those are the things that, that describe us pretty well. Uh, and you know, cancers are something that, you know, we're dealing with more and more, um, you know, over the next 30 years, um, you know, the number of cases, new cases of cancer are projected to increase by over a million per year. Um, and uh, so essentially what that means is that these wolves may offer uh, a unique model system to understand 
um, you know, how the mammalian immune system might come to be more resilient in the face of these uh, sort of cancer inducing pressures. I find that fascinating because one of the things that I really struggled with when I was investigating animal trafficking is, you know, at the end of the day, there's a question of like, why should we care about wildlife and biodiversity? And, you know, obviously there's arguments about, you know, keystone species and how they sustain habitats and things, you know, but ultimately for a lot of people they are like, I don't know, like, it's just on my list of priorities, caring about, you know, wild elephants is pretty low. And, but what you're talking about is that, you know, there are creatures out there that are responding to the stressors that we're, you know, putting in the modern world and they're overcoming those stressors in ways that we could benefit from. But it sounds like part of that is that that evolution only works if there is genetic diversity within the populations. And it's like, if you look at tigers in Asia and like, you know, captive breeding programs, like they're all inbred or like the mountain lions here in Los Angeles, they're like a medieval royal family. Like there's like, there's, there's, there's a very limited gene pool there. So I was curious, what is the consequence of reducing genetic diversity within populations? Yeah, so the type of evolutionary change that I'm talking about specifically <clears throat> is like this doesn't arise by new mutations, right? So typically when we think about evolution, it's like, oh, a new mutation rises up, you know, it appears and then it changes some individual, it becomes beneficial and then, you know, it gets passed on. Um, the type of evolution that I'm talking about is evolution on standing variation, right? So it's evolution that's acting on what is already present. And genetic diversity, right, that is basically the, um, you know, that's that's the money of, uh, of adaptation, right? So the more genetic diversity you have, essentially, you know, the larger the toolkit you have to respond to changes in the environment. So as you whittle away that genetic diversity, um, you essentially whittle down that toolbox and individuals become very limited in how they can respond uh, to any given axis of selection, right? So be that, you know, urbanization or a drought or uh, a hurricane event, anything you might throw at them, they overall become, you know, less fit to be able to respond to those things just because the genetic diversity becomes more and more limited. So Shane, I've been flagging a few questions that have come in um, that are specifically germane to the topics that we're on. Um, a couple that, uh, that I want to flag. Uh, first off, Roz asks, is there an advantage to rapid reproduction on an unstable planet? And if so, why would a slowly reproducing creature like a large mammal, aka us, have a chance? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so there are certain aspects of life history that will give animals um, a foot up, so to speak. Um, you know, when it comes to dealing with rapid change. Uh, so, if you have very large population sizes, uh, if you have very high genetic diversity, and if you have very short generation times. This means that the process of evolution can act more efficiently and, and um, more quickly per unit time, right, for, for a given species. So, you know, talking about things like mice and roaches and, you know, and those sorts of things. On the flip side, uh, you have animals like, you know, elephants that are, they're gargantuan, they have relatively small population sizes, and they have very long generation times. So African elephant is pregnant for almost two years before they give birth, right? And in that time, you know, there are some species that will go through a thousand generations. Um, you know, so they're just very different time frames. And those species, those large, um, long-lived species, are much less um, equipped to deal with rapid change because they take the hit harder and they're slower to respond per unit time, especially when we're talking about human-induced change because it happens so quickly and because it happens so rapidly. But um, that being said, you know, my lab has even found instances where, um, for instance, elephants um, have also, like we see the effects of selection and evolutionary response to that selection, um, you know, in very short periods of time. Uh, so we've been studying um, the elephants in Mozambique and their response to the Mozambican civil war, uh, which was accompanied by a lot of um, heavy poaching for the ivory trade. Uh, and amongst African elephants, um, most individuals are tusked. Males are almost always tusked. In Mozambique, uh, in Gorongosa National Park, where I work, 
Um, there's never been uh, a tuskless male ever observed, but there's a, a small proportion under normal circumstances of females that are born without their tusks and they never grow their tusks. Um, but during this period of the Mozambican Civil War, is about 15 years, uh, after that period of heavy poaching, about half of the surviving females uh, were tuskless, right? So you get this rapid increase in frequency of this tuskless phenotype. And then those females pass that trait on uh, to the next generation. So even in the generation after the war, individuals that you know had never experienced that pressure, tuskless females were still overly abundant with respect to um, you know what there was before the war, right? And that process of differential survivorship amongst elephants, right? That is selection. And then that turnover of even just a single generation right, is evolutionary response. Um, and in this case, the individuals that we're talking about that survived are still alive today, right? So the oldest uh, females that um, uh, you know that we we caught um, that we've uh, tranquilized in Gorongosa were she was like in her 60s. And the Mozambican Civil War was from the late 70s to early 90s. Wow. So one term that I'd never heard before I spoke with you is the term evolutionary medicine, which was just one of those things that like hits you and it totally changes the way you look at the world. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about practical examples of evolutionary medicine, what that means. And then also Mark had a question that relates to that, which is whether there is evidence that wolves at Chernobyl do have a greater or, you know, reduced cancer rates compared to other wolves. Yeah, so uh, so let's start with this idea of evolutionary medicine. Uh, so there was this um, physiologist, this dude named August Crow, um, in the 1920s. He posed this idea, which uh, come to be known as Crow's principle, and that you know for any given problem uh, of medical interest to humans, there's some organism or a set of organisms on which those problems can be. Um, most efficiently studied, right? And that's based on the idea that evolution by natural selection has produced all these extreme forms to adapt to all of these extreme uh, environments. And some of those environments mimic essentially disease states that, uh, that humans experience. So for instance, if you think about animals that adapt to really high altitude environments where there's low atmospheric oxygen, uh, a lot of the solutions that they come up with to live in those extreme environments are also applicable to um, you know, pulmonary diseases in humans. Right? It's the same system, you know, the same uh, ultimate problem, right, which is oxygen deprivation. So understanding how they figure that out may help us to understand how to treat that in ourselves. And now in this living world that's responding to anthropogenic change, um, you know, we may find more instances of that. So, again, if you think about urbanization uh, and, you know, the potential effects that it may have on the human body, those organisms that share time and space with us, they're eating Doritos and we're eating Doritos. They're, you know, they're, you know, sucking on car tailpipes and we're sucking on car tailpipes, like all of the environmental pressures and pollutants and things that we're exposed to. So those animals are also exposed to. Uh, the major difference being, you know, selection, we can observe selection happening uh, and study that selection in a much more efficient way by using those organisms that uh, that occur alongside us. Right? And that's this basic, you know, so that, that's essentially the basic principle of evolutionary medicine, this utility of life for understanding medical problems. Uh, and then- so Where do uh, alligators fit into that then, for example? Yeah, so uh, I wanted to, to answer that wolf question. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, the, the short, so the short answer is, you know, we, so this is a project that, um, you know, that is in its beginning stages, uh, but we, we have found um, very strong signatures of selection in the Chernobyl wolf genome at genes that we know are directly responsible for anti-tumor immune response in mammals. Um, yeah, essentially, and basically, um, all of the largest genomic signatures of selection. So those things that genetically differentiate wolves in Chernobyl from those uh, in Belarus, right outside of the uh, Chernobyl exclusion zone, those regions of the genome, all of those regions are involved in cancer, essentially. So we're trying to understand um, exactly, you know, what that means for these organisms. Now we've actually partnered 
uh, with a couple of cancer companies, um, you know, to uh, hopefully use this population of wolves to, um, you know, to gain a better understanding of, um, you know, how they're dealing with, uh, with cancer related stress and how they, uh, how their immune systems respond and may respond differently. So on those wolves, Diane had a question. Generally, she wanted to know uh, thoughts on gene editing to assist in rapid adaptation. Um, so it seems like that could apply. So say we find genes in wolves that are, you know, helping fight cancer. Is that then is the application then gene editing or? What so, is that? The, so the application could be so it could be gene editing. It could be gene therapy. Um, yeah, so um, not so much like directly editing the human genome, um, you know, but um, but developing molecules that um, help to alter the product of genes right, in a way that is beneficial under given circumstances, right? Something that more closely um, mimics what you know what we might see uh, in this population. Um, so, but gene editing, when you talk about gene editing, you know, when it comes to conservation or or other things, you know. I think it's an ongoing conversation, right? So it, we've moved beyond, you know, the you know the prospects of can we? We know we can. We can do it. In a lot of cases, very very easily, uh, and we have done it. Um, you know, the question is, you know, when do we do it? How do we do it? You know, should we do it? And, you know, like those specific questions, because you know, again, right? As much as we like to think we can control the natural world. History has shown us, if anything, that we can't control it nearly as much as 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 we expect to be able to. Um, so when you're talking about gene editing, especially edits that can be passed on across generations, editing the germline of a species, um, you know, any number of like there could be any number of uh, of potentially unintended consequences. But it's something that's being looked at, you know, very closely uh, right now. And so. Then I guess that's, you know, another question. This one's from Everett is about the the way we look at evolution in humans versus other animals now. Like have we with healthcare and, you know, all the other, you know, aspects of the modern world managed to slow evolution in its traditional form for humans? While, like, you know, other animals, we, you know, the anoles have a storm come through, a ton of them die off, and then they can stand the cold. It sounds like humans potentially have slowed that process and instead are relying on other processes to overcome those, those stresses or adversities. Yeah, so this is a complicated and interesting question, All right? So one of the things that makes us unique as a species is our ability to buffer ourselves against environmental change um, in large part, right? It's like, it gets too cold outside, I turn on the heater, it gets you know too hot outside, you know, I'll turn on the air conditioner. Yeah, you know, and that buffer, you know, um, you know, acts as uh, a, essentially a protection against the process of selection, right? So I cool off instead of dying of heat exposure, right? And that happens for a lot of individuals, right? And uh, instead of like me having to physiologically be able to withstand that more, which is what happens to every other species on the planet, uh, more or less. Um, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean that humans aren't evolving or adapting. Evolution basically is essentially a mathematical inevitability when it comes to any living system, right? As long as you have variation uh, and you have um, the differential passing on of alleles, either by chance or due to selection, you're going to have evolution. Um, and, you know, we're dealing with changes, you know, we know that we're dealing with specific changes now as humans that are direct result of, of technology, you know? So for instance, you know, we, are living longer, healthier lives than we ever have before, uh, which means that you know later in life there are um, specific diseases that affect us that don't affect us earlier in life, um, like many sort of like uh, degenerative uh, diseases. Now, the genes, like how selection works, is through differential survival and reproduction, but the mutations that are responsible for these late life diseases you know, they essentially escape selection because by the time their, uh, by the time uh, their effects become apparent, the person is already a parent or a grandparent or maybe even a great grandparent. 
Um, right. So those genes have already jumped forward one or two or three generations uh, before selection can even act on them, which means that selection can't act on them. Uh, it, it is what we call the shadow of selection. Right? These uh, these genes sort of hide in that shadow uh, where selection can't act. But that in itself right, is evolution. Right. The rise in frequency of these specific types of mutations is in itself um, evolution. So I, I think this relates to that. It's a complicated question that I don't fully understand, but it, it looks like it might relate to this topic. It's from Dawson. It says, can Shane speak to the difference between microevolution and genetic drift? Differential survival to a catastrophic event may select for a certain trait, but that isn't evolution in the classic sense unless the selected traits are genetic and persist over many generations, right? So, um, there's a lot in that question. Uh, so, um, so genetic genetic drift is essentially um, that random change in an allele frequency across generations that I was talking about, right? So you have genetic drift on one hand, and you have natural selection on the other. Microevolutionary change um, that evolution um, occurs when alleles are passed on to the next generation, but they only need be passed on one generation for evolution to occur because evolution, it's not a forward looking process. It's a response to an environment, right? So evolution isn't working towards anything. It's not pushing organisms towards anything. It's responding to something, right? So if you have a very, if you have, you know, an event like a hurricane uh, that, you know, causes differential survival because, you know, some individuals in a population are better able to hold on to trees than others. Those are the individuals that survive. If those traits are genetically based and they're passed on to the next generation, those individuals have children who on average are better able to hold on to trees. Once that, once those genes are passed on to the next generation, that's an evolutionary response, right? That, and, you know, but that response, it doesn't have to extend multiple generations for it to be evolution. It just means that that evolutionary response is very temporary and fleeting. Okay. So Richard has a question that I'm sure all the Hollywood people are going to love, which is, can evolutionary medicine be applied to recent strides in regeneration of limbs? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's a very active, um, is a very active area of research. So, you know, there are, um, you know, there are other vertebrate species. Um, so for instance, uh, organisms like the axolotl um, that, you know, if you chop off an arm, if you, you know, um, you know if you chop off an arm, they um, can actually regrow that arm digits and all. Um, and trying to understand that basic process, right? The fact that, you know, these are also vertebrates, like we share a common ancestor, um, you know, we share, um, a very similar genome for the for the most part. Trying to understand, you know, the molecular changes that allow, um, you know, these these or these types of organisms to regenerate entire limbs, you know, it has led to advancements in our understanding of you know of regeneration and repair, like biological regeneration and 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 repair. Um, will it ever end up in us being able to like regrow an entire arm, you know, in the same way that you know this amphibian does? I don't know. Uh, you know that that's hard to say, but it certainly uh, has already led just the. Um, uh, just the research that has gone, you know, into this, you know, extreme phenotype that occurs in the natural world uh, has already lended um, advancements to, to the field of medicine. Yeah, and we can definitely use it in film and TV. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that is certainly true. Um, Lou wanted us to circle back and talk about um, the research into alligators in Florida and um, presumably the evolutionary or uh, medicine you know, possibilities there. Yeah, so in Florida, um, yeah, so uh, one of, uh, you know, one of my graduate students uh, and in collaboration uh, with the, the Parrot Lab at the Savannah River Ecology Lab, um, you know, we've been studying this population of alligators that um, lives in uh, Lake Apopka, this is the fourth largest lake in Florida. Uh, during the 1980s there, the Tower Chemical Company 
um, you know, spilled a bunch of pesticides uh, into this uh, into this lake. Um, pesticides that included, you know, chemicals like dioxins, uh, which are a specific type of chemical um, that mimic estrogen, right? So they're endocrine disrupting compounds, which they affect um, they affect uh, reproduction, they uh, affect sexual maturity, et cetera. And, you know, this population, you know, at that time, um, that lake was populated by thousands of alligators. Uh, and right after that chemical spill, there was a population crash. And uh, in the early 90s, scientists began studying this population to understand the effects of these chemicals. And, you know, they, sh they described essentially all the ways that the endocrine system was disrupted in these, again, you know, long-lived apex predators, right? Things that share, you know, alligators can live like up to 50 years, maybe even more. Um, and, you know, they describe things like, um, you know, ovarian infertility syndrome, uh, which, um, you know, which many, many women uh, suffer from, uh, which forces them to go into premature menopause. Um, uh, feminization of males, so like microphallus, um, the, both the, the parent, the, um, uh, the appearance of both uh, testes and ovaries in the same individual, uh, these sort of disruptions. Uh, and this population is actually a big reason why we know so much of what we know about our own endocrine systems and how we respond uh, to chemicals. Um, but no one had ever looked at the evolutionary consequences. Right? And at this point, you know, there have been several generations. Uh, and about 15 years after the spill, we noticed that there's a, a pretty rapid uptick in the population, despite the fact that even now, um, that lake is, is more or less just as polluted as it was, you know, when the chemical spill happened. Right? So it's a, it's a super fun site, um, you know, which is a site that the government, you know, tags as a site that it will take an incredibly long amount of time to actually clean up. Um, you know, and so we've been looking at uh, specifically female alligators in this population to ask if we can see any signatures of selection for reproductive resilience in the face of these endocrine disrupting compounds. Uh, and the, the short answer is yes. Um, again, we see like very strong signatures of selection. One of the big, biggest signatures that we see in the alligator genome are at this gene that's called basonuclein 1. Um, which is also in humans the primary marker for uh, for primary ovarian infertility syndrome, right? So the you know you have these um, these massive reptiles that you know show very similar um, physiological um, maladies as you know as some humans that seem to be governed by the same gene. So understanding how that gene has changed in these alligators to allow them to become more resilient in terms of reproduction in the face of, you know, this constant exposure to estrogen mimics may lead us to, um, you know, to solutions for understanding, you know, potentially how to treat genetically based um, primary ovarian infertility syndrome in humans. Okay. John has a question that I'm a little afraid to find out the answer to. Uh, so, you know, we've talked about things like Chernobyl and the super fun site in Florida and the, you know, the hurricane that wiped out the green and uh, you know, all these various events that, you know, caused, you know, these, these uh, changes, these rapid evolutions. Uh, John wants to know, is COVID causing micro evolution? And if so, what, uh, what's likely to be the result? Uh, so um, is COVID, co so that's a complicated question, um, you know, because, you know, I don't, I don't have the data on hand to say COVID for sure is or isn't doing any given thing. Like I'm not a COVID researcher, um, but certainly, you know, diseases, you know, um, are one of the most powerful selective forces on the planet. Yeah, you know? and um, you know, recently there was a paper published looking, I forget what popul what human population that they were looking at, but looking at ancient signatures of selection. Um, that um, that they think are also associated with COVID. So, you know, the, the virus itself, you know, uh, can certainly be a selective pressure. Uh, and, you know, there seem to be some, at least some genomic evidence that it has been a selective pressure in the past. Um, now, the issue is, um, what complicates the issue now is the factors leading to differential survival, right? So one of the keys to evolutionary change is that, the differences in survival 
have to be genetically based. Uh, and I think the differences that we're seeing in survival, we know have an incredibly, um, have uh, a very significant environmental basis, um, right? Be that um, political, be it economic, be it racial, et cetera. You know, this sort of, you know, the more abstract aspects of human civilization um, are big determinants of who survives and who doesn't. And in those cases, you may have selection, but if there's not a genetic basis to that differential survival, then you won't have evolution. This probably relates to that. Mark wants to know, how do social forces influence evolution beyond the changes in individuals who carry the mutation? Do social animals have adaptive advantages over others? Um, as a sidebar, I hope that social animals don't have advantages or writers are in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah. uh, so scientists might be in, in a lot of trouble too. Um, let's see, so, um, I see it's sort of a complicated question. The so the if I like the question is like the effect of culture on the process of evolution is that Do the core social of the animals have adaptive advantages? I think is just what it boils down to. And I, I know it's a broad question. Yeah. Um, so in in some cases, certainly. All right. So um, you know, if you look at the most successful organisms on the planet over long evolutionary um uh time frames. A lot of them are social animals, like, you know, the most abundant um, organisms on the planet in terms of numbers of individuals are things like ants, right? So you social organisms, like they take sociality to the next level, right? In the sense that ants in a colony act more like cells in a body than they do like actual individuals when they're grouped together. Um, you know, uh, the... Uh, evolution of sociality also leads to specific um, specific buffers, you know, in terms of, you know, if you think about, um, you know, savanna life in the African savanna, right, hunting as a group versus hunting alone uh, increases the chances that somebody's going to get a kill. Uh, and if you can share in that kill, um, you know, then everyone benefits, you know, it may not, it may not benefit an individual as much as if they were able to kill something on their own and eat the entire thing by themselves. But in terms of overall probabilities, you're doing better, right? And on the flip side of that, if you are something that's being chased and eaten on the savanna, if you are living by yourself versus you have a thousand other individuals around you, that changes the probability that you specifically are going to be the one that's taken and eaten. So sociality certainly has, um, has its advantages. All right, we've got time for a couple more questions here. Uh, so it sounds like a lot of your work um, you know, involves looking at, you know, things like Chernobyl or Florida, where like maybe there's some catastrophic event, how things react to it. Um, Tasha is curious about the consequence of the massive use of disinfectants on city streets, uh, she says in Asia mostly, um, in response to COVID and whether that will make additional changes to urban wildlife. I don't know if anybody's looking at that yet. Um, so the answer in, is, is probably yes, right? And the, um, you know, in terms of like urban wildlife, you know, the, um, the evolution of, um, you know, of uh, resistant microbe strains like bacterial um, and, and viruses that are like resistant to, um, you know, to antibiotics and things like that. Um, you know, anytime you pose an environmental pressure, something like disinfectants or, um, you know, or antibiotics, you give a population of microorganisms, you know, an opportunity to adaptively evolve, evolve in, in response. And uh, there was a paper that was published, I think, late last year, um, that basically um, showed that there's also an increase in the specific strains of uh, antibiotic uh, resistant microbes in things like bears um, that share, you know, think, you know, bears that will scavenge human food, et cetera, et cetera. The microbes that have infected us and become, you know, adapted to antibiotics because of our medicines, you know, are also being passed on uh, to other species, right? There's bears don't take antibiotics, you know, as, as far as I know, I mean, they may take, they may have, um, 
you know, some, uh, you know, some medicinal herbivory that happens that allow them to deal with certain things, but it's actually the specific strains of, um, of antibiotic uh, resistant microbes that are being passed on uh, to other species. Okay, I, well, I'll take one more question from uh, the group and then I had one last question for you after that. So first off, Jeffrey wants to know, is there evidence that some animals are altering the timing of their breeding seasons in response to a change in environmental conditions due to climate change? Timing, of, so, um, so in animals, um, I can't think of a specific example. Um, I would be surprised if it wasn't the case, but I do know that for instance, plants, you know, like the flowering times of plants um, are certainly like we can look over the past hundred years and see how those flowering times have changed, um, you know, sort of year by year, um, you know, as climate has changed and seasonality um, has changed. Um, there are other aspects of seasonality that causes, uh, for instance, you know, um, uh, changes in timing of life of other life history traits. So for instance, many animals that occur near cities have become more nocturnal than they would be otherwise to avoid um, being around humans. Uh, and uh, species that have to deal with seasonal changes, right? Uh, so thinking of like Arctic species that change coat color um, from, you know, they go from like winter white to summer browns or summer blacks. Um, like they, there's an evolutionary mismatch that's happening now because the change in color is, um, is meant to be an adaptation to snow, right? So it's a cryptic coloration, but it's actually cued by the light cycle. So as, uh, as day length changes with respect to when snow is on the ground and not, you get this sort of mismatch in life history um, because of climate change. Okay, and then last question, obviously uh, none of us would be here if we didn't uh, believe in the value of exchanging ideas between scientists and folks in entertainment. As a consumer of media yourself, how, you got a ton of Hollywood people here, how would you like us to maybe look differently at how we portray science and scientists, or do we nail it 100% of the time, no notes? Uh, you certainly don't nail it 100% of the time. Um, I'm gonna throw that out there. Um, you know, I think, so there's two major things. Uh, I think one, um, I think scientists have have a tendency to be the bad guy I, a, lot of, a lot of times, um, you know, and then, you know, there's like the big, like hulking muscular hero. Uh, it'd be nice to see, you know, maybe a change in that that dynamic, maybe flip the script a little bit, so to speak. Um, yeah, and the the other thing is, you know, uh, leaning leaning into the science, um, you know, to give depth to some to some story arcs, yeah, you know, in a way that you know, in places where you know, some people I think have a tendency to sort of lean away, like let's ex, ex, uh, sort of explain it away. The example I bring up all the time is um, is Jurassic Park, right? I love Jurassic Park, you know, but I do have to shut off part of my part of my brain, um, you know, when I watch the movie, you know, there comes this point where they find out that the dinosaurs are reproducing, um, you know, and they're not supposed to be. It's like, oh, we genetically engineered them so that they don't do that. So how come they're doing it now? Like, oh, because we used a frog and we inserted some of the frog DNA to fill in the gaps. And some frogs, you know, turn from male to female. There's a lot of complicated stuff there, right? So first of all, frogs are really far related um, from like we're closely, we're more closely related to uh, to dinosaurs than frogs are. Second, there are many reptile species that exist today where the entire population are, is is female, and they give birth by you know they reproduce by giving birth to clones of themselves. And that parthenogenesis is actually a much simpler explanation for this phenomenon than, you know, than what's posed in the movie, but it's also biologically real. Wow, that's all the, that's all the time we have today, but I wanna thank uh, Shane and Will. I just wanna let you know that as communications officers at the National Academy of Sciences, it is such a joy to put great communicators like the two of you on our stage. Thank you so much. And both of you, uh, there was a lot of fantastic feedback in the Q and A from the audience saying, great presentation, great job. You guys are so interesting. I was, my phone was blowing up too. So thank you both 
uh, <clears throat> for doing this uh, today. We really do appreciate it. We had over 60 questions, so obviously we weren't getting to all of them. I'm so sorry if we didn't get to your question today. And I want to thank everybody who did ask a question. And I want to thank all of our the supporters of our program who uh, come in at the supporter level. Um, we really appreciate uh, your support of our program and our work. And next week we will be off again, but we will have an event on February 9th, and that will be on companion robots with Maya Matarek. She is a fantastic speaker on the subject. I hope you can make it. Uh, please make a note on your calendars. We will be starting 30 minutes later than normal uh, for that event on February 9th. And hey, thanks everybody for joining this week. We'll see you soon.